Okay, then I think we should just start. Um, so thanks to everybody for coming. Um, as you'll have seen, the title of this presentation is Destroying Education. This is not to offend anybody that's working in education, but perhaps you have some thoughts on it as well, given that you've turned up. And so I would like to make an opening statement. I'll be drawing largely, well, a lot on the ideas um, of uh, Sugata Mitra and Sir Ken Robinson, who sadly passed away at the weekend, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. So um, neither of those two could turn up today for very different reasons. Um. I shall share my screen. Once I put the presentation back to the start. This is, sorry, this is my first ever um, time using Google Slides and it shows. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yep. Great. So we're all here to destroy education. As you can see, that's not a particularly original idea. It's not mine solely, and it's not a new idea. Uh, we believe that education is not fit for purpose, <clears throat> that the educational industrial complex creates compliant workers based on an outdated industrial age premise. In many places, there are 21st century kids being taught by 20th century adults using 19th century curricula and techniques on an 18th century calendar. Legally mandated and institutionally organized education is standardized to a bell curve. It truly only suits a small cluster within that and refines that cluster to an elite as we go through elementary, junior high, high school, university, perhaps onto postgraduate doctoral studies to become a professor or a fellow. Organized education is an exclusive elitist pyramid scheme supported by tax and private finance, often leaving graduates in huge debt with no guarantee of net gain. Institutional education is the modern form of indenture. We believe it should be the duty of schools to help learners find their innate talents help them to develop those talents and turn them into skills they can use in the working world so that they can lead meaningful, happy lives. Schools should not set entrance qualifications. They should not be repositories of knowledge. They should not use or implement legally mandated curricula or ways of study. They should not group by age or subject. They should not grade or test. They should never pass or fail. They should not set homework. A learner should not be able to fail school. Schools must realize that only they can fail learners. Schools should be places that facilitate learning, that prepare learners for the future, that take a personalized holistic approach, mixing focus on the mind and the body combining the theoretical and the applied, not the academic and the vocational. Schools should facilitate working groups on multidisciplinary projects across national boundaries. Learners should be able to choose, to discover and develop and revel in their talents, to generate a body of work, a portfolio of achievement, not a resume or a collection of badges and certificates. They should gather testimonials, become masters of practice and not masters of ologies. If there is general agreement on some of those things that I've said, these are the questions that will arise. So I'm gonna stop the share for now and come back to this. At this point, 
I'd like to introduce Mike Lyons, who I've had several discussions with over the past year or so. Mike runs a school called Soul Japan, and he's taken that from the ideas of Sugata Mitra. So Mike, if you could tell us uh, about what you do uh, in um, up to three to five minutes, please. Well, okay, three to five minutes is going to be difficult. I'll do my best. Um, all right, so Sugata Mitra was, uh, is a computer scientist, not an educator. And he, um, he was working in Delhi in the late 1990s, uh, working in a very you know, posh, nice, brand new office building doing computer tech for American companies and you know, exporting the tech. And uh, um, he didn't feel good about seeing kids in the slums outside of his computer, outside of his office building. So he embedded a few computers into a wall and just sort of left them there for kids to play with just to see what would happen. And these were kids that had never seen a computer before. Mostly they were illiterate. Um, they had no idea what the internet was. They'd never heard of it. But these were internet enabled computers with s some software put in. And uh, they were implanted into the wall at sort of uh, a meter height. So they were a convenient height for fairly young kids. And uh, there was a, just a sign there saying, these, com these are free for you to play with, have fun, that's all. And so a bunch of kids gathered around the computers and they played with them. Uh, they made trial and error discoveries. Hey, if I, if I click here on the little picture, something happens. And uh, they told their friends about what they had discovered. And the friends told other friends and they all made more discoveries and they all told each other. And uh, what happened then was over a very short amount of time, illiterate kids with no, um, with no instruction became computer literate. Yeah, with no, no instructions, just peers. And so, so Sagata Mitra thought that was really interesting. He, just, yeah, he called it self-organized learning. He replicated the experiment again and again and again and again. He did it in more and more complex situations. And every time there's, pretty much every time there's been a lot of success. I started doing it myself in 2015. And uh, yeah, that's all I have to say about it. If you have any questions. So one of, the, one of the ideas that's been built on, that uh, Sagata Mitra built on that was uh, uh, the self-organized learning environment and um, schools in the cloud. And the learning takes place uh, with a big question. And I believe that this is what, Mike, you've implemented at your school and in your classes. Could you tell us about that, please? Yeah, uh, the, the, uh, Sagata Mitra figured out that this self-organized learning happens best if it is directed by a question, a form of inquiry-based learning. It's when, that's when it works best. So sole instructors, sole facilitators, begin the session by asking a big question, usually a uh, multidisciplinary question to the students and it's usually challenging not something that you can answer in a few minutes a difficult multidisciplinary question and uh, students use the resources that are available to them on the internet and try to solve that problem uh, in my classes i have my students create a presentation of what they discovered and that is the, the uh, end product. That's what is evaluated, the presentation at the end. But I believe Simon has a different plan today, not a presentation, something else. Slight, slightly different. Um, that's, that's great, uh, Mike. Uh, you told me once about the first time you did that. I think that was, was that your university or your high school class? The first time I did it was at Major University. Uh, with about uh, 60 students. Um, I didn't really know what was going to happen. 
I invited the students to the computer room because the computer room happened to be free that day. And I thought, what the hell, I'll give it a try. I put the kids into groups. I gave them a selection of big questions they could choose. I explained the process. I showed a little bit of a Sugata Mitra video. And I said, off you go. They had uh, about one hour to do research and to prepare a PowerPoint. In the following week, they had to give, uh, give their presentations live. But in the first week, um, they did their research. And the quality of their products was mind boggling. They were, these were universe, Japanese university freshmen, and they were producing first draft master's level PowerPoint presentations. It was fantastic. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Pretty empowering stuff. Yeah. Um, I'd also, I'd, well, I'd now like to introduce Kevin Bell, who's joining us from Sydney. Um, for full disclosure, I've known Kevin since he was 13 and I was 14. Uh, we f were from the same town, Whitley Bay, in the northeast of England. We used to play football together. Kevin is a uh, remarkably, remarkably so much better footballer than I am. Um, <laughs> Kevin used to live in Japan. He was on the JET program and then worked for uh, a couple of schools here. And he's since had a career in uh, education. Uh, including uh, putting together online um, solutions during the SARS um, outbreak, building a career on that, and is recently the um, author of um, Gameful, is it called, Kevin? Uh, Gameful Design textbook. G Gameful Design, which, is, uh, uh, which looks at uh, Gameful Design, game mechanics and gamification. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, available at all good booksellers. So Kevin, if you could just give us a, a, a sort of, a, 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 you know, some words on your experience with the SARS epidemic and what that led to in, in sort of alternative approaches. Sure. Um, I've got my clock started to try and keep me to three minutes. Um, it struck me when, when Mike was talking about um, Sugata, that uh, Sugata was at Newcastle University, wasn't he? So, so there's yeah. clearly a theme there that Newcastle developed the steam engine coal and terrible football and now we're going to reinvent education so it seems to be a thing um but yeah i sort of limped into hybrid and online and blended education through my master's degree that i did in the states after i left japan <coughs> excuse me um and part of that was was being old enough to be around uh, during the time of, of the sars epidemic when we at my institution at the time were kind of worried i think we reckoned we had budget for about four weeks if classes couldn't meet so we had a, a sort of burning platform to start getting everyone to think about online and blended. This was early sort of 2000s. Um, so that was the first sort of push towards that. And then I guess over a few iterations and a few positions, I've really started to dig into how we can make that better. Because that was, you know, you're literally PowerPoint, discussion thread, announcement, done sort of model. Um, so as I got more into this, um, I moved through a couple of institutions and ended up at Southern New Hampshire, um, which really invested in their online program and, and we developed from about 20,000 students when I started to about 80,000 when I left. Um, and that was a fairly traditional online model. Um, although we started towards the end of my time there to look at uh, what would be a disruptor for that. And on the board at the time at Southern New Hampshire was um, a guy called Clayton Christensen, who many of you have probably heard of, MIT professor who was doing a lot about disruption, first of all, in industry, and then looking at education and saying, what could change here? What would change here? And his driving question is always, you know, what's the job to be done? And he uses metaphors such as, you know, if you're out actually looking for, if you're out looking for a drill, you're not actually in the market for a drill, what you want is a hole, which is a sort of flipping the, the way of looking at it. Um, and we started to play with that. And we looked at traditional education and traditional online education and that I think feeds into Simon's discussion today, what bits of that just don't make sense. So, you know, building on Simon's comment about how to build innate talent, talents, we realized in a way that a lot of the intrinsic motivators, things that are sort of buried under games and experiences where one might get to a sense of flow are things like level of challenge, immediacy of feedback, um, competition, collaboration, all of these things can be put together and they don't have to be put um, in their entirety. It can be that just some of these layers can be put on and we track the kind of intrinsic motivation that happens among groups when they have 
drivers. Uh, one of them can be narrative, which is where you get to your Dungeons and Dragons version of the world. But I worked with an instructor at University of New Hampshire who allowed the students to pick their own story to illustrate concepts in microeconomics, which was great because some students talked about their grandparents coming from Russia because of scarcity, et cetera, et cetera. And others talked about, you know, a trip to Mars to find new resources. The mnemonic tool doesn't matter, right? If it speaks to you, it speaks to me. And that notion of sort of memory palaces and very obscure metaphors, sometimes obscene metaphors, helping you remember stuff, fine. If that's what helps you learn the fundamentals, then I think that's valuable. So we started to play with freeing up content and freeing up concept and saying it doesn't have to be my version of psychology 101, it can be someone else's. And the other thing at, at Southern New Hampshire, we started to play with the modality. So we launched a competency-based program that became College for America that you may have heard of or you could easily Google. Um, and the main features of that were that they were competency-based. Um, so to Simon's point earlier as well, no one failed. They just didn't yet have a competency. And it was seat time agnostic, which meant someone who maybe had had a lot maybe hadn't had a lot of opportunity, but was actually really smart and really quite driven, could come in and do what was a two-year associate's degree in months. And I think our fastest was about five months who drove it through, um, which again is a motivator. The level of challenge for him was to move at pace and move through these competencies. Um, so just some of the elements there, gainful design, uh, seat time flexibility, competency versus pass fail, putting some of those things together, I think starts to get us to a model where you say, look, this isn't business as usual. This is a different model. That program, College for America, was the first federally funded competency-based program in the US, which meant we had to take it to the feds, to the Obama administration and say, I know this has never been done before, but can you approve it? Because it allows us to reduce tuition and get students from disadvantaged backgrounds through the program. So sometimes there's sort of the bill in something that just is right and hoping like hell that it will get approval and get through. So, you know, a lot of serendipity there, finished at Southern New Hampshire, went to Northeastern, lived there for a while, Northeastern University in Boston, and about four years ago, got an offer to come down to Western Sydney University here on the outskirts, which I did through till the end of last year. And then I moved on to bigger and better things, and then COVID hit, and I haven't quite hit bigger and better things. <laughs> Kevin's looking for a job if anybody's got one. Go on. <laughs> Thanks. Ke at the minute. But yeah, that's, that's sort of my take on it. That's, that's great, Kevin. Thanks. I'm really pleased that you brought up the uh, the drill in the hole uh, analogy. Seth Godin takes that on a little bit further, and he says you don't um, you don't want a drill, you want a hole. But actually, you don't want a hole, you want a roll plug to go in the hole. But you don't want a roll plug, you want a screw to go into the roll plug. But it's not the screw that you want. You want to put a shelf up. Um, you, so you need a bracket, but you don't want the bracket. You want the shelf. But you don't want the shelf. Uh, you want to put your books on the shelf um, so that your room will be clean and your wife will be happy. Exactly. Yeah. And so yeah. these are all the processes we can go through to achieve happiness. Um, so it, it's, I'm really, really pleased you brought that up because um, I use that all the time. I, I've, I steal well. Um, so those are some, those are some opening thoughts. Uh, Jose, could you manage hand raises and could you uh, invite anybody to speak? So if, if you can raise your hand, if you'd like to speak, you can either do that physically or with the button. Okay, uh, I'm sorry to be late, Simon. I will apologize to you. I said I'd That's be- That's all right. But uh, students being students. Okay, everybody, uh, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions. So if you raise your hand uh, by using the raise hand button in the participants list, the participants list can be seen by looking, by clicking the participants button at the bottom of your tab bar. On the bottom left of that is the raise hand button. And I will watch the raised hands in order and bring them to Simon. Otherwise, um, I will also try to watch the chat for any questions that are there. And if you really feel like you just want to butt in, yeah, I suppose you can do it a little bit with your voice. Otherwise, please use the raise hand buttons. So yeah. uh, please, uh, everyone, you can do that now. And these are not specifically questions for me because I don't have any answers. Mm -hmm. So discussion and thoughts are very welcome. I have one. Fire away. Um, that's a really provocative title, Destroying Education. Yeah. Uh, I must think that you've probably thought about it a lot or you practice a lot or you've given this presentation a couple of times. And I was wondering if you have, uh, what was the reaction uh, for people who may have been a little bit grumpy saying, oh, how dare he say something like that? And at the end, <laughs> did you manage to convince people of your thinking? 
I've talked about it quite a bit. Um, I, I put those slides together just this morning. Um, oh, the, really? <laughs> yeah. These are, these are thoughts I've been gathering for a long time. I wanted to destroy uh, education ever since I was forced into it at the age of four. It was horrible. It was a vile experience all the way through till I was 18. And I think many people feel similarly. Um, of course, it does provide, um, you know, it's not, not completely without merit. Um, but yeah, I think uh, it's, it's very challenging statements, very bold statement. And as I say, I don't really have any answers, but I do know there are a lot of people that uh, struggle with their own education or perhaps with uh, their children's education. And uh, a one size fits all solution, which is practiced uh, in a lot of places, doesn't work. Okay, we have a question uh, from Jennifer. Uh, I believe that's Claro uh, just now. Uh, let's see, I guess this is the Simon. Simon, how much would all three presenters say this relates to student empowerment? Uh, brackets Frere, I suppose that's uh, an academic's uh, name. I see Japanese university students as disempowered. Sorry for no mic and no video. Yeah, um, I think I'll pass that one over to Kevin. I don't know Frere, although I'm watching Vikings and I think it's one of the Norse gods, but <laughs> it's an academic writer as well. Um, see Japanese university students as disempowered. Um, look, I think, I think, I think what technology brings, and I, I relay this to people when I'm getting academics to think about putting content online, you do have students who, you know, particularly um, certain cultures who, who don't feel comfortable shouting out an answer on uninformed, uninformed opinion. I went from teaching English and living in Japan for about, what was it, 10 years or so, straight over to the US and did my master's in the US. And every class in the master's, the instructor would say, okay, round the room, everyone has to participate. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm not super comfortable because I don't feel I've really got a valid opinion yet. And I know half the people here haven't read the book. So I was sort of caught between the almost didactic sensei model to the everyone has to speak even if they don't know what the hell they're speaking about. So I think there's a middle ground there. And I think the advantage of, of hybrid and blended environment is, you know, those who feel comfortable and who've done the reading can speak out in class. Those who, who can't or don't want to or are too shy can have time to look up a few words and post in a discussion board. So I think there's opportunity there with the technology to sort of speak to different learning styles. And also one of my case studies in, the, in, in my dissertation slash book spoke to this, the, the sort of democratization of participation and gameful stuff's good for that because you're not participating as Kevin versus Simon, one of us is gonna win, one of us is gonna lose. You're participating as a member of team X or you're participating as a member of team Y and whilst you want to contribute, it's not you failing. If the team doesn't win, hey, we didn't win, right? It's not me fail. And I think that's another opportunity where you look at games and, and activities, um, particularly video games, but not necessarily. You fail at a video game, you get pissed off, you get up, you try again. You fail at a maths quiz and you say, I knew I could never do maths and I quit. And I think that's you know, a common part, I think the British psyche is somewhere between Japan and America in terms of sort of shyness and, and pushiness. <laughs> um, but I think we've all got a bit of that where we're nervous and things that sort of reduce that fear of failure are, are key to empowering students. And I think if the culture is, you know, a bit more reticent in terms of coming forward, then there's even more reason to, to embrace that. So I think that is, is certainly another reason to kind of look at some of these concepts of game for not to make a, a Dungeons and Dragons version necessarily, but just to look at what ways you can sort of encourage people and nudge them along. Thanks. Well, you fail your rate levels and you, you can't go to university, you drop out and, um, and you go into prison or you're excluded from being able to complete these tasks in the first place because of learning differences. A recent study in, the, in Scotland showed that 50% of uh, residents in a young offenders um, institution are, are dyslexic. And uh, I should imagine that's a result of them having failed at school. Uh, Louise. Hi, thanks for hosting this session today. It's really, really interesting. Um, and I've been wondering myself for quite a while how to affect change from within the system. Um, a prime example is that I teach a course called self-directed learning and it's graded. <laughs> and <laughs> it's, uh, you know, the, the faculty that I'm in recognize the um, benefit of helping students to manage their own learning, to provide them with the support for that. Um, but 
be, and, and they don't even want the class to be graded, but outside of the faculty, it's just been uh, forced to um, adhere to the same standards as the rest of the university. Uh, even during the COVID outbreak, when it seemed like there might be a chance uh, that we could have it as a you know, pass fail. And basically, if you come and do the work that you pass and that you're there just really for your own self development. Uh, but in the end, it was voted against. And so I just feel so helpless, because even for a class where it's the title of the class, the objective of the class is for students to evaluate themselves and manage their own learning, there's still this teacher judgment at the end. Um, and I just think, well, if I can't affect change there, in what situation could I affect change? Yeah, it must be, must be really frustrating. I mean, I think that's the thing about institutional education. It institutionalizes everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, if we want people to do what they choose to do, and if they choose something that can't be graded or it can't be enumerated, how, how do we assess them? Yeah, I, and we have to give a number, not even a grade. You've got right. to give a number like 86, 49, 27, 98. So it's very, very specific, not even just S, yeah. C, so. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's nonsensical, isn't it, really? <laughs> Completely. Yeah. Actually, uh, Sugata Mitra um, posted on Facebook a couple of days ago on the very thing that uh, you two are talking about, how to do evaluation. Uh, how, how to assign a grade uh, when you don't want to don't want to sort of toe the line when you want to give the students self self direction and give them um, self organization and he said that it is possible he uh, he outlined a method um, uh, while you're all chatting I'll try and find the link and I'll post it for you. Thanks. Yeah, I, I saw that. Yeah, it was very interesting. Um, Simon Robinson, please. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, yeah. Um, the issue of well, like assessment really bothers me because like, I think the students should be assessing themselves. And like, it always comes back to this conversation about, well, how do we assess self-directed learning? And I think for me, the point is you don't. So I regard myself as a fairly successful self-directed learner of a number of things like Japanese, for example, uh, and surfing. Um, and there's nobody assessing my Japanese or my surfing except me and my peers to the extent that I choose to participate in those activities with peers. And so... I don't, like, in terms of my Japanese, you know, the test is life, it's how I communicate, it's how people react to my Japanese, you know, my sort of dodgy immigrant Japanese. Um, it's how, how much do I enjoy reading a novel? It, it's, you know, do I get confused reading the news? The answer is yes. Um, the test is within the task itself, and it, it, it's in how, it's in me. And I don't want or need anybody judging my Japanese. I mean, if they want to help me, that's great, especially if I want them to help me. Um, and so, like, I don't feel any need. I'm, I work in the university system, and like, I uh, forgot your name, was it Jennifer? Um, was saying, like, it's, you have to grade in the Japanese university system. And I, I object to it. Um, but also, moving that on, like we're saying you know like we're not happy with the idea of assessment i personally find it frustrating that teachers always end up talking about how do we assess this um but i want to even i want to try to take this even bigger okay so um I, I can never pronounce his name but sugatra mitra um put these computers in the wall and the kids figured them out and they didn't need any assessing on that but they didn't need any teaching either and so to me, I don't honestly know, I don't, I don't think I should have any position really as a teacher. I mean, if people want to come and listen to me and learn from me, great. I'm happy to share what I, what I, what I have learned. And that, that, that the word sharing, you know, it's kind of like the internet where people put up how to YouTube videos for fun. Um, but I don't, I'm not entirely sure <laughs> I kind of want to paraphrase Yoda here and say there is no, there is no teach, there is only learn. 
Um, and I don't like, it really bothers me. I don't, I'm not sure what my role is in another person's learning, particularly if they don't, not in, if I, I have no role, if they don't want to listen to me, if they don't want to learn from me, I have zero role. Yeah. Um, and if they do, great, then it should be, to me, it should be a, a dialogue, a conversation between two equals where somebody is wanting to learn from me and I, you know, share what I've learned and help them. Um, and they kind of assess for themselves whether I'm a useful person to them. And for a while I may be, and then they move, may move on. Um, and so I really just question the whole idea of, um, like what our what our relevance is to an, what my relevance is as an educator <laughs> yep. to another person's learning <laughs> if they seek me out or they find me interesting fantastic and that's about it yep okay um, that was I'll, long. I'll stop I'll stop you there if I, if I can Sam thanks for that <laughs> now, it brings up some really really good points you know and Adam had put a question in the chat about this you know um I do not see learning and education as being synonymous. Oh, okay. uh, I, th I think we should be looking at uh, education, learning, training, and schools. Education is legally mandated or institutionally uh, guided. People are told what to study, where to be, and how to study it. Learning, of course, we all have the innate ability to learn. And as, as Simon points out, uh, that can happen irrespective of anybody being there or there being a set goal. Uh, training has usually been... Um, used for skills for work or vocational skills. Why there is a division uh, between uh, academic and vocational, I have no idea. Um, uh, so Ken Rumson puts this uh, uh, succinctly to explain the difference between um, education and training by saying that most parents would be quite happy if their children had some sex education at school, but probably not so if they had sex training there. Um, and then schools, what, what's the difference uh, between all of these schools that we have? We have elementary, junior high, high school, universities, colleges, polytechs, blah, 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 blah. They're all places where people gather together, hopefully to learn and hopefully in the way that they want to learn. So that's why I want to concentrate on is learning and teachers and everyone who becomes a teacher uh, is a facilitator of learning. Um, we, because we are institutionalized, because we've been through this hierarchy, some of us have titles. I'm sure I've offended some people here who are professors and doctors. I know at least two doctors who are here. There are probably more. And, um, you know, this is something else that Sir Ken Robbins says that as far as he can see, the only function of the pyramid of education is to produce university professors because that's what it leads up to. It's a natural pyramid that goes all the way up. And this is what we need to destroy, I believe, that institutional hierarchy and that pyramid it's a hoop to jump through indeed it's a hoop to jump through a hurdle to cross okay so the questions that um i think need addressing if there if there is some general agreement here and uh, at least there seems to be at least uh, one or two that do are in uh, a document that everybody can add to and it would be great um if you could add to that document, which I shall share right now in the chat. Um, although I'm just sharing it to Mike privately at the moment. <laughs> There's a document <laughs> there with today's questions on, and they are also um, up okay. on the screen now. So how do we find things that we like to do? How do we identify talent? how do we or should we assess at the start or assess improvement should we be looking at uh, assessing engagement but surely we should be looking at assessing well-being and happiness that should be our ultimate goal and then especially in these covid times uh how do we engage face to face if we envisage a non-institutional non learning where people are not grouped together by age or by subject but they're in teams working on projects and we encourage learners to talk to as many people as they can and learn as much as they can from them and to spread that knowledge to other people. Uh, we should surely be looking at children speaking to adults and uh, aged adults, in fact. How can we facilitate that? And whilst you're uh, contemplating that, I'm going to stop that share. They're all... Um, they're all in that Google document that I shared with you. I wanna get around to today's workshop and task. And uh, Jose, I'm gonna make you host so that you can handle the, uh, the breakout rooms, if that's okay. Okay. 
<laughs> because you're skilled at it. And um, if you can make me a co-host, if I'm not one, that, that would be super duper. What do you need? Or uh, just tell me what you need with these. Okay, ones. so what I would like you to do is to create, how many people do we have? We've got 34, so that's four. Mike, what do we think? Seven and eight? Or three of 10? Or four of seven and eight? You're on mute, Mike. You're muted, Mike. Groups of seven or eight are good. Okay. So, Jose, what we're after is one breakout room with you, me, Mike, and Kevin. That's Kevin Bell. And then the remaining... Oh, so... There are going to be five, five breakout rooms. Five rooms, okay. Um, five breakout rooms. Um, before everybody goes into the breakout room, I'm going to share today's task, which again is up on a Google document. And I'm not going to give you any instruction. Oops, that's just going to Louise. Sorry, Simon, just yeah, quickly. One, one sec. So Sorry. yeah, we, we want five breakout rooms. So say one with you, me, Mike, and Kevin, and then the others dividing the remaining people into four groups. Uh, me, okay, wait. <laughs> okay, that's a lot. Hang on. I know. Uh, uh, I might be still at it, but it still takes time. Uh, let's see, you, me, I gotta find every other 30 people here. So um, what, one of the- I'll tell, tell you what instead, Simon, mm. okay? Uh, you, me, Mike, and Kevin, all of those people just stay in the conference room. Do not hit yeah. your breakout room button. Okay. okay. It won't move you. Yep. I yep. will then see who lands where yep. and I will move them around so that then we get relative. Okay. Numbers. So our, our role, Jose, Mike, Kevin, and myself will play the, the grannies and come in and help if it is needed. Uh, I need uh, help. <laughs> hopefully everybody can see the task. Okay. Uh, so we have rooms of five or six, and I am ready to hit them anytime you like. Oh, yep. and how long do you want them? Uh, say 20 minutes. We'll try and finish at 15, but let's say 20 minutes. And you will have 10 seconds to come back, or you will be brought back into the conference yep. room in 10 seconds. That's a nice tight time. And please, please read and complete the task. Okay. Everybody ready? Anybody with a question? Oh, ooh, Lang, Louise, Louise. Can't see the task. It's in the chat under today's task. I don't know the game called my bluff. Stop, stop. Wait till you get your breakout room. Oh. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. you get it in your breakout room. <laughs> okay. That's We're part good of to the go. task. We're good to go? We're going to yeah. go. Yeah, Here yeah. we go. What would you do next time or do better? How can you help each other out? If this was a course or a bigger project, how would you delegate and break down into learn? I, I have a suggestion. At yeah. some point, ask Louise how, <laughs> how it was. Right. <laughs> ask Louise, okay? Louise okay. Kawai. Yeah. Oh, okay. Why? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're going to love it. Uh, but you already, you know, she's already a great person, but you're going to love her answer. Okay. Uh, Mike, I'm bringing everybody back in, okay? Yeah, group five is done. Right. Are they the last? Uh, I don't. Some. Some. I don't think some are ready. But. I think Group Four just made it. And did you figure out how to extend the time, Simon? Yeah, it just said keep. There was a button that just said keep open. Said, yeah, keep it. Just the, don't don't touch this button. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope that didn't give you any exam or stress test. <laughs> test stress. Sorry. We had a good old time. <laughs> that was hilarious. Yeah. E excellent. <laughs> Um, so I, I don't have, um, I don't have anything set up how anybody can give their answers. Um, but it would be good if uh, a team could volunteer to go first. And what I would like, what I want teams to do is, uh, say their team name, show us their logo, place your jingle, and then present your word and, um, uh, follow the rest of the instructions for call my bluff. So, um, who would like to go first? Oh, and by the way, of course, it's on the understanding that nobody cheats and looks anything up, right, on the internet while this is being asked. You're on your honor. Who wants to go first? You think we have honor? <laughs> <laughs> Any volunteers? If there are no volunteers. Oh, breakout room four didn't name their team. So we have the pasties, we have bulk fermentation, we have uh, the jennies, we have OBC, and we have the team with no name. 
Oh, that's a pretty cool name, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like horse. I have a horse <laughs> named after that. Yeah, yeah, right. Quite. So who wants to go first? Volunteer or I'll just choose somebody. Can I volunteer us, teams? Ab absolutely, you can. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to, shall I spotlight you, Louise? Okay, sure. Is Louise the spokesperson? Was she duly elected? We didn't do an election, no. <laughs> But you can see the name of our team. Um, and we came about with this name because there was a, a screen share that went wrong at the beginning and we were all looking at something about bulk fermentation. Excellent. <laughs> something that happens in our classes, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, our, what was the next part? Our motto is we rise together. No, together we rise. <laughs> bulk fermentation. Yeah, and we're gonna hear our jingle, Simon. Fermentation. Together we rise. <laughs> that was played live, by the way. He's played that. I should have spotlighted Simon there. Oh, <laughs> oh you heard me. Probably and do you, do you have a logo? Yeah, who, who's going to share the logo? Oh, I can hold on. Hmm. Um, You'll have to come off spotlight for that, Simon. Yeah, done it. Done it. Uh, oh, am I sharing? Oh, there. Oh, all right, <laughs> somebody else did it. Excellent. <laughs> Do I, do I detect uh, the hand of uh, Dan the bread maker in all of this? <clears throat> okay, I'll fire away with your word then. Okay, so our word is C eloquent, C eloquent. And actually this word uh, has quite a long history. Um, think of it in two parts, the prefix. Uh, it comes from a Egyptian god of wisdom, which was originally spelled S-J-A. Uh, and also a Norse god of victory, and that was S-I-G-R, but it evolved over time, much as languages do. And uh, combining this idea of wisdom and knowledge with the, the, the root of eloquence, it describes somebody who is so naturally good at what they do that you would think from the beginning, just looking at them, that they are a winner. You'd never doubt that they were going to ever fail. See eloquent. Wow. Is there another definition? Which word? T H. Is there another member of bulk fermentation to give an alternative definition? Oh, we weren't only supposed to tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Maybe I'm bluffing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you, are no you, what's going on here? Are you done there, Louise? I'm done. Yeah. Anybody else from bulk fermentation want to speak? I'll turn over to the liars. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I think the other, another definition of C. eloquent is, um, you know, someone who is using a lot of aspiration in their speech. So they like the, um, when you have the tissue in, in front of you that it, it blows out. Um, excessively, use of excessive, excessive aspiration in, uh, in your overly eloquent speech. He's a pen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and this, this sounds good, but the actual definition is building on the um, was it the Egyptian goddess of wisdom. So, si eloquent is people who try to sound intelligent by using longer words and rarer words. There might be a few of those here today. Okay, um, so uh, I failed to set up any way to record answers. Um, so can you put which answer you think it is into chat? Is that going to be the best way? If everybody who's not a member of bulk fermentation can just put in either one, two, or three. Uh, first, would you mind uh, spelling that for us? <laughs> it's S-I-A-L-O-Q-E-N-T. And that's actually a real word, right? These yeah. are all, all real it, words. Told you what it meant. Yeah. Yes, definitely a real word. Come don't, we have, don't we have one more definition coming? Nope. No, we have three. I think it's only 3,000 on the general word list, though. So. <laughs> but two wrong and one right, right? <laughs> yeah, why isn't Charlie Brown here when you need him? I'm pleased he's not here because he would just be floating around winning, wouldn't he? Really? <laughs> no one likes a winner. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, so we've got lots of ones, a couple of twos, a couple of threes. And I'm just going to do uh, a quick count. So one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We've got eight ones and we've got 31 participants. So we're not quite at a majority decision. But who cares about democracy anyway? And we've one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven twos. There's a poll function for the answer. I know, I just couldn't find it. 30 minus the bulk team. <laughs> okay, so um, where is the poll function? I'll, I'll try and we'll get that going for the next one. I'll help you with that later, Simon, Thank but you can't you. engage it now. It has to be engaged at the be before the meeting begins. Ah, uh, okay. Well, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Stop voting, please, for one. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, for two and a couple for three. So it seems the answer was definition number one. Could you recap what that definition was, please? Yeah, it's drawing on um, ancient Egyptian and Norse god um, terminology, which was referring to the gods of victory and knowledge and uh, how, the, how you would believe that somebody is going to be knowledgeable and victorious uh, just by looking at them because they, they are so eloquent in the way that they um, come across. They, they're full of confidence, they're full of knowledge and Excellent. you think that they'd fail. Simon, um, I have a suggestion for um, how you can get the answers a little bit faster okay. uh, this time around. Yeah, the reaction buttons, number one. Yeah, yes. just about, yeah. Yep. Okay, excellent, I'll do that, yeah. And so the correct definition is? Not mine. <laughs> Not my. Nikki. The correct definition? The correct definition was number two, people who spit a lot when they speak. Excellent. Ah. Thank you very much. Excellent. That was bulk. This is a pen. <laughs> yeah. That was uh, that was bulk fermentation. It did very very well. Can we hear from pasties, please? Wow, I'm going to say that uh, Louise. That was a masterful blunt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't play Maybe. poker with Louise. Um, oh, she's so full of it. Louise, you're full of it. <laughs> it's that you're bulk fermentation. Full eloquent. <laughs> okay, pasties, please. Who's going to speak for pasties? I was thinking Todd would. Todd. Todd. Todd says no. Todd, Todd's got some. Bill. Bill. These yeah, people I'll are really good Bill. at making other people work. Bill, you're <laughs> not the director of PR. So it's Me? okay. You're you're the Moodle mood trainer. It's oh, Todd. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> if you can unmute Todd, yourself, Todd's Todd. been spotlighted. <laughs> The guy's trying to watch Netflix. Give him a break. <laughs> no, I don't. Why me? Why me? Oh, gosh. All right. Uh, well, that's because we had a, a process, and these guys were – I was the, the in the sweatshop when we were doing this, and these guys were doing all the, the uh, heavy-level thinking. All right, so I, I will give us the word, and then I'll pass it to the other people to give the do, – Do we have a, a logo, a strap line, and a jingle? We do. Hang on, let me pull it up real fast. <laughs> um, we we went the. Uh, you want me to take care of the jingle? Yeah, it's there. Okay, ready? Here we go. I don't know if you guys can be able to hear it, but it's right. Oh, one second, one second, one second. All right, here it is. You can't you hear. Share your sound. No, yeah, yeah. Coming up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it in a nutshell all right so our word is oh wait our other thing what was our other thing strap line our strap line what was call strap our line? buff <laughs> sorry call our buff oh there you go oh yeah color okay thank you so now suddenly everybody wants to actually do the work <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our He's word struggling. was, oh gosh, I can't even pronounce it now. Nudie Astertion. There you go. Glenn, take it over. I've just typed it in the chat. Nudie Astertion. 
All right, so uh, why don't we go around, everybody give the definition starting with uh, Bill, first definition. Okay, first definition um, of or relating to the day before yesterday. I'll give the uh, second definition. Relating to people with a disposition towards nudity. And um, Louise? Um, yes, relating to an 18th century art movement in Vermont. Oh, okay. So, uh, excellent. So, as Jose suggested, can you please vote with a reaction, a thumb up or something like that? Uh, okay. Definition one, does it refer to things about the day before yesterday? Uh, number two, is it excessive nudity in public places or something like that? And three, is it a, a Vermontian art movement? So, so number, spe number specifically, one. Specifically, Adam, number you one. take it from here. You give the answer. Okay, so specifically, use the raise hand button in the participants list if you are voting yes for number one, number one only, number one uh, only. Raise your hand. We vote for our own group. No. Okay. <laughs> only for yourself, please. Yeah. <laughs> number one again is over relating to the day before yesterday. Distortion. Nudie distortion. So far away. <laughs> So number that's, two that's is... one, wait 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 that's one two. hang on keep keep your hands up i haven't counted them <laughs> don't raise don't lower your hands one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven eleven can you make a note of that jose please hands down everybody i got it there you go they're cleared okay, okay. uh four choice number two can choice number two be said again please yes it is relating to people with a disposition towards nudity Choices for number two, please uh, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, one, one person. Are we finished? One, two, people. Two, two people. Three, because I'm partly nude. Three, three man. Four, five. I counted five. Five? Yeah. How did you count five? five? Because there was one manual hand and there are some on the other screen. Oh, okay. I'm only watching the bird. Okay. And the official number is five. <laughs> Hands down, please. <clears throat> you can do that, Jose. Yep. -er. Okay. Number three. Can we have the definition again? Well, one more time. Definition three is related to an early 18th century art movement in Vermont. Okay. The, I just cleared all hands. So uh, uh, art century or, or art movement in Vermont. Number three, raise your hands. Simon, give me the official number when you're done. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six it is. Yep, six. six. So that's 11, five, and six. So the winner is, what, sorry, the most, the most popular answer was uh, one, which was? Glenn, number one relating, again. Number one answer was relating to the day before yesterday. And is that correct? Huh? Yes. Yes, Adam, it is. You're yeah. supposed to say the answer. Or should I, yes, that's it. Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. You called buff. <laughs> Thank you, pasties. Okay. Pasties it's paste. Yeah. What was the logo? Yeah, we need a pasty. It was, it was, it was um, people without clothes on, censored. Oh, was that, that was the logo. Oh, I see. I that thought that was, was just part of the theme song. <laughs> okay, and then shall we move on to uh, the, there are two teams that don't have names, are there? No, we've got uh, pasties, bulk fermentation. Uh, we've got OBC. Go over to OBC, please. Okay. So, uh, first of all, did, Wendy, did you come up with a logo? Miss Wendy Goff? Oh, sorry. No, okay, no logo. No logo. And, and the caption or the uh, tagline. Oh, there we go. Yay. Hey. Okay. No logo. Yeah, that's a logo. And, um, the caption is overcoming the ball of confusion. And I guess our theme song is ball of confusion. That's what the world is today. Hey, hey, so like 80s song. Yeah, and anyway, um, so the word is, um, I, th I think, do all of us, we remember uh, um, one definition. So I'll just, I'll just say the word is cacorafiaphobia. Cacorafiaphobia. And it means an abnormal, persistent, irrational fear of crows. Can someone type it in so we see the spelling? 
Okay. Yeah. I got it. Thank yeah. you. Wow. Kagoraphobia. phobia. Okay. Definition number two. It is an abnormal, persistent, irrational fear of failure. And shall we go with number three as? Yes. As yes, Lang. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, normal, inconsistent, rational fear of failure. <laughs> A normal, inconsistent, rational, rational. rational. Yes. rational. Teresa? Normal, consistent, rational. So normal. Okay. Hmm. okay. Is Teresa still here? You're muted, Teresa. Hi. Uh, yeah, number four. Uh, number four is an abnormal, irrational fear of crow's feet. Mm. Yeah. I love a normal, it. <laughs> irrational fear of getting crow's feet. So we have four answers. We have mm -hmm. four answers. Stacking the odds. It was a team effort. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Simon, you're muted. Who thinks, who thinks number one, an irrational fear of crows or a fear of crows? Hands up. Raise hands. In the participants list mostly, but otherwise. One, two, three, four, if you could note that. And definition number two was... Um, a fear of failure. A fear of failure, thank and you. Raise that, hand. Was that oh, an, ex an excessive irrational fear of failure? Um, abnormal, persistent, irrational fear of failure. Abnormal, okay. persistent, irrational. Okay. Hands up now, please. So that's one, two, three, four, five. Ooh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. <laughs> I'm glad there are so many because I'm completely terrified. I've got this wrong. Oh, by the way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then no, number three, uh, number three was uh, a rational, yeah. a rational, a normal, a normal rational fear of failure. Fear of failure. Hands up for that, please. Failure, basically. One, two, one, two. Oh, come on. And number four was a fear of developing crow's feet. Abnormal fear. <laughs> yeah, abnormal <laughs> fear. Of and we've got uh, <clears throat> we've got two for that as well. Ooh. Three. 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 So the most most popular answer was two, which was uh, a morbid irrational fear of failure. And Wendy, is that correct or not? That is correct. That's correct. Well done, everybody. Our team. Yeah. Well done, everybody. Okay, so the last yeah, team is the job. team. The last team is the team with no name, uh, which is Carla, Kumiko, Purple Zebras, and Stephen Se Clark. Second last team. Me done. That's Two more, yeah. We we are the Purple Zebras, actually. Ah, you are the Purple Zebras, right? Yeah. Okay. And there's the Jennies and Jakes after that. There are two, oh. two teams left. Oh, Jenny's and Jake's appears to only have one person in it now. Don't be afraid, yeah. you failed. Okay, uh, Purple Zebras, go ahead. Okay, our word is, uh, hold on, let's try it again. Purple Zebras. Sorry. Uh, purple Zebras, do we have a strap liner logo and a theme song? So, someone has it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> someone has it. Yes, if you can't see them. Who was on your team, Stephen? Um, uh, no one. Three other people. Carla, Kumiko, I, Lisa, it. and Stephen. Yeah. One person made a logo. And where and, is she? Um, yeah, I can't was... remember her name. Do you see her? It was either uh, Carla, Kumiko, Risa, or Stephen. Oh, uh, one person name? left. Did we they take the logo with them? Yes, she did. She, oh, stole, did. she stole our logo. I, I have it here. 
Oh, good. I can share it if I have that um, permission. Okay, let me try. Yeah, I want to see this. It's, our logo. <laughs> it's, a, it's a purple zebra. Excellent. <laughs> I well, think our theme was um, dealing with chaos. We couldn't understand the instructions very well, so we were de dealing with chaos. That's purple something. zebras dealing with yeah. chaos. Excellent. <laughs> well, you know, when you think of zebras, you think of chaos. You know, it's it, right? It's the image that does it. <laughs> that looks very kind like of an electric. Uh, I think we have like a head bashing purple yeah. zebras kind of theme song. Yeah, great. Is that yeah. an octopus riding a horse? Yeah, it looks like it. But the, Actually, no, I can't unsee that. Away. That is an octopus riding a horse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is truly truly a chaotic purple zebra the drunk guy drunk guy riding a horse do you have Let's a hope it's only riding the horse do you have a theme song we we didn't think of it at all so yeah as i said i think we were trying to deal with chaos i think okay. um i think my, lisa just, you know lisa just sing it right purple zebras yeah that's, that's right, right. <laughs> excellent look at, her cafe. <laughs> look at her cafe it's also purple stripes <laughs> There okay. You kind of a live uh, house, by the way. So. Cafe. Could we have your word and definitions, please? Uh, the Damon answer. Has it. Uh, the word is ulotricious. <laughs> U l o t r i c h o u s. Can you put it in chat, please? Chat. Yes. So I can it wrong. Tell me now. Our group. You have it, Stephen. Go. I have yeah, I got it. I put it in there. It's in there. There it is. Mm. Ooh, enjoy. <laughs> okay, and uh, yes. we have three yeah. definitions. So my group, if I say it wrong, please correct me. Uh, definition one, the condition of having woolly or curly hair, uh, for example, uh, alpaca or sheep, not the zebra. No. And uh, B, uh, so two, uh, the condition when a plant outgrows its potted boundaries and can no longer sustain itself. And three, uh, the medical condition of eyelash introversion, <laughs> uh, i.e. ingrowing eyelashes, which can cause a number of uh, conjunctivitis symptoms. Excellent. So number one. It, uh, um, <laughs> I forgot. I can say again. Yeah. Uh, number one, curly hair. Number two, potted pants outgrowing their pot. And number three, inverted eyelashes, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. So who thinks number one, curly hair? Hands up, please. So we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, seven votes for curly hair. Seven cleared. And for a uh, potted plant which has uh, breached the pot, who votes for that? Hands up, please. One. Two. 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 One, three. two. Three. One, two, three. Three for the potted plant. And hands down please definition three inverted or ingrowing eyebrows one two oh, eyelashes. eyelashes sorry eyelashes eyebrows. <laughs> i often confuse the two one two three four five five six seven seven eight 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 so eight. it would appear that uh, ingrowing eyelashes is the most popular answer Stephen. Uh, the correct answer is uh, having woolly or curly hair. There you go. Yeah. How many of our members here today are ulotricious? I am. <laughs> oh, there's Louise. Hey. Oh, he said woolly and curly. I didn't catch the woolly. Oh, I want to change my answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that, I, that was, that was <laughs> making the session worthwhile. I've needed a word to describe my hair for years. <laughs> <laughs> You're very late right for me. You're very welcome. Okay, so finally we have the, the Jennies, the Jennies and Jake. And I think there's only two members there. We've got Mike and Yoko, which seems a bit sad. Is Yoko here? Oh, I don't see her. 
Yoko. Yoko. Right there. You're, you're muted, Yoko. Hi. Hi, Yoko. Okay, it seems as if you bear the burden uh, for this whole team. So, uh, name, strapline, logo, tune, word, and all definitions, please. Where did the team go? I know that Jenny was probably called back to work. Oh. Uh, one, of, one of the team was uh, outside working on his driveway, which became the strap line. Do you remember that? <laughs> Yoko? Oh, strap yeah, driving. <laughs> yeah, building driveway. Yes. Building a driveway. Building <laughs> yes. a driveway. What a great strap, strap line. line. And uh, the jingle was a uh, song, just like. Jenny's and Jake's building a driveway, but uh, all right. And then there was a logo as well, but one of our members took that with him. Okay. Well, let's go straight into the word and the definition, sir. Oh, sorry. What, what's the word? Please, can you say the word again? I haven't said it yet. Hasn't said it yet. <laughs> oh, please. Dentacular. Dentacular. Gentacular, yes. I've just put it in the chat. Gentac, oh, okay. Who knows? Huh? I think Jenny made up that word. <laughs> yeah, that's right. She is Gentac. Okay, the definitions, please. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, Jenny, there's Jenny. Yoko, do you have definitions? Actually, I cannot access the Google Doc, but. Mary made it for us, but sorry, I could not access to see. Where is she? Is she gone? She's gone, yeah. Oh. Or maybe she just lost her connection. Uh, maybe. And unfortunately, I could not open the Google Doc. Okay. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, that's okay. All right, then. So uh, let's, let's wrap that up there, then. Um, <laughs> Thank you everybody for indulging uh, in this um, experiment. Uh, if anything, uh, if you could uh, raise your hands and Jose, if you could call people in. Did, call them. Mm. Did, did we learn anything? Yeah, a couple of words. <laughs> I just read the comment. The comment says, the first instruction in the Google Doc was, organize yourselves. Who's who's playing music there? I think it's Teresa. No, oh, no, no, it's not me. Are we going to get Zoom bombed? So excellent. I've not gotten Zoom bombed yet. I want to get Zoom bombed. <laughs> who's who's playing that horrible music? Turn it off. Please. Mute them all. Mute them all, host. I want to acknowledge the fact that since March, our lives have changed. It's Melania. Oh, oh, God, turn that off. Simon, mute them all. How do I do that? Okay, it's in the, um, an impact in the that under meeting. My deepest sympathy goes out. Jose, you're the host. So I've just done it for you, Simon. I muted everyone. So you have to unmute yourself. What was that? You know, one of the when someone had some background. Someone was noise. having a really good time, <laughs> and this is what happens when you do actually engage anarchy as a, a normal yeah. part of your environment. You yeah. do have to deal with that. Did anybody manage to get around to the uh, the questions in the Google document? So this is a, this is kind of an open question. Um, what does anybody think the point to any of that was? Working together, obviously. Okay, here we go. Uh, Quimby. Um, just to sort of put us in the situation that our students are, uh, how confusing it can be to, to organize yourselves and to figure out what to do first and then who does what and then who's going to speak when. Um, it takes an awful lot of, of effort to, to get this show going. So definitely I can understand how our students feel. <laughs> Thanks. Next, Scott. Yeah. yeah, I would add to that. We're fortunate that was in our first language. I can just imagine if that was in Japanese, oh. how poorly I would do. <laughs> and Louise. Yeah, I think it was an exercise in finding who had strengths that would help the group. 
Um, in my case, I just was able to say, nope, I'm not doing the tech side. One of you do the tech. I'm more interested in the language, etc. And I think it was, uh, it was uh, drawing on our different strengths. Carla. Yeah, it might be interesting. So each group, we needed to organize themselves. And so if you could choose a different leader each time, so even the shy students could take over a leadership role in the group, I think that would be a good idea as well. I'm sure quieter students don't want to talk or anything. So if you make them become the organizer, at least once during the activity, it would be a, an interesting thing too. More hands are invited. Uh, Louise. Louise. Uh, I think it gives um, opportunities for people to do different things. For example, when we got into the group, some of us didn't know the game that we were playing. We'd never heard of it or what a strapline was. So started Googling and sharing and screen sharing information with each other. Um, so it gives people the opportunity to take on different tasks within the same um, overall structure of what you're doing. And then one of our group members pulling out a ukulele, for example, Ooh. while we're trying to go through the, uh, the website that we're advised to go to to get a right. jingle. And he's like, oh, I've got a ukulele and starts playing in the background. So uh, I think these opportunities um, came out of that. Right. Teresa. I said, oh, I said, sorry, no, please go on. Teresa. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, organization or like you do that and you do that and you do that. And then we were even we had some trouble. We had some tech trouble on my side. Uh, we still got the task generally done because we delegated. OK, you look up that you look up that I'll look up that. And so it was a team effort. Uh, one person just didn't sit there and do nothing which sometimes happens in groups of students where, ah, I don't have to do anything, everybody else is doing it. So getting everybody to do at least one thing gets the task done on time. Bill. Yeah, I think um, something like this would be valuable for students who um, can watch other students do um, like, Oh, like if someone said, well, I don't, we don't know what this is. We don't know what a strap line is. And someone says, oh, I'll Google it and I'll look it up. And maybe another student says, oh yeah, I should be, you know, pretty proactive when I don't know things. So I think that's a bit of um, peer scaffolding maybe or peer instruction that um, when students are together, like in, in my seminar room, I can see students working on the computers together and someone just tells another student how to do something technical when they didn't know how to do it. Um, so I think, yeah, in, in something like this, when there's a lot of different things to do, um, students can see other students being successful and they can maybe learn how to do it themselves. Simon. Simon, you're on mute. You're, you're still muted, dude. <laughs> oh. Ah, try again. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Can I be a little critical? Um, you can say anything you like. Okay. Ooh. Um, like, I thought it made, like, I kind of figured out what you were going for, like, right at the beginning. And I was like, okay, you know, this could be fun. It's a rainy afternoon. I don't have anything else to do. Um, but you didn't you you made some assumptions about learning that I don't think like I think we kind of need to examine like you you you, you didn't ask us whether what kind of task we wanted to do and you didn't ask us like what our interests were you sort of I mean I know we'd all turned up for your workshop and I'm fine with that but to me like that you set the task as a teacher and like, I think that's questionable because I think we should be helping students learn what they want to learn. Yeah, I agree. Obviously, we had 15 minutes and, and 35 people, so I had to set a task, I felt. Yeah, I know. But, the, like, maybe the, the lesson there is that we can't rush what we're doing. Like, I get through a lot less material in, in a semester since I started asking my students what they want to learn and what they're interested in. Mm. Um, and, like, that was kind of because I'm a kind of high tension person um, and I used to like go through a lot of material very quickly and keep my lessons very fast. 
And what I learned slowly over, you know, a couple of decades was that every time I rush something, it goes badly. And the trick is like, we've just got to slow down and move at the, the again, you, you chose the pace and you said, well, we're going to do this and I don't have much time to do it because I've only got a two hour session. And you never like, sorry, I know this is really critical. Like, I'm trying <laughs> not to be rude. Um, but you didn't ask us what we wanted to do. I mean, I, I, I actually wanted to come and talk about the ideas and approaches and my experiences. And I didn't realize I was going to have to play blind man's buff. Call my buff? Call for my an buff. hour. And like, I, honestly, it's a rainy afternoon. I don't have anything else to do. You know, it's locked down in an hour anyway. Um, but like asking, like, being clear like honestly i got insight into what my student you know i'm sure we all have students who sit there going and i kind of felt like that and it's like well okay i understand how students are kind of frog marched into my classroom by the whole industrial educational complex they don't really want to be there and you know i try really hard to to be accepting of that and try to work with them on that like emotionally i'm like okay you don't want to be there but you want credit and i want to get paid um, let's see if we can somehow co co cooperate with each other and, and do something that we both find beneficial. Um, yep. Okay. And, Thanks. Sorry, Simon. Okay. Adam. Uh, okay. Simply put, it was fun, <laughs> uh, for everyone except for that last bloke. Um, so anyway, <laughs> um, fun social activity of, uh, instead of, the teacher leading, basically just everybody having a bit of fun together. Um, why not? Thanks. Glenn. Well, initially I thought it was going to be something similar to that, uh, that anecdote you mentioned where the, the PCs were put into the wall for passers-by to use, but I didn't think it was really all like that because in that case, the users got to choose what the hell they wanted to do and whoever was around with them got to help. There was no set goal. Now for us, there was a set goal, mm. but certainly in our group, initially there was confusion because the instructions weren't explained to us. We had to read them. So I wonder if part of this was set up so that we would kind of see to ourselves, we actually need to be clear when we explain things to students. Mm. Okay, great. That's Yep, that, yeah, sorry, go on. Or did you want to go, Simon, or did you no, want to no, go? No, no, no. Dan. I'm just picking up off that. There's definitely a lesson in here about how doing task-related stuff can be extremely productive, but it requires very careful setup. Um, you can leave gaps in the information and have discovering elements of the task as part of the activity, but you have to provide enough of a framework that students or learners can start to operate within it. So things like discovering exactly what the game was through searching online was a nice dynamic within our group, but it also sucked a lot of time out of the activity. So task supported is fun and is very productive potentially, but it needs a certain amount of structure. Just one final thing, cycling back to what Simon was saying about um, learners choosing their own activities, choosing their own tasks and setting their own agenda. I agree, but I do think there's a problem when we frame it as learners are there because they have to be and we're there because we want to get paid. There are at least some learners in a class who are there because they want to learn something. They've, they've come seeking an aspect of knowledge and we are in a position where we can provide it. Now we want them to guide us towards what they want to learn and we want to facilitate their learning of that. If, to, to extend the analogy, we want to provide the computer and maybe give them a login for it at the very least and be there to answer a question if they have one. So it doesn't have to be this entirely separated framing. You know what I mean? Hmm. Jose. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, everyone. Um, I, I would like to sort of frame this in a sense of uh, the dynamic nature of being able to spend time with students. Even if uh, the students were given exactly a task like this, very framed, uh, specific uh, goals, but quite confusing, but purposely confusing. That doesn't mean that the next time these students are given something similar, 
with an elevation of the goals or an evolution of the goals towards a specific progressive point that this can't go to where what um, Simon, uh, I'm sorry, Simon, I don't know your last name. I, I can't see because there's the Robinson. word bulk fermentation in front of it. Um, once where um, the, the student's wishes and the student's desires and the student's own personal goals can't be taken into account. You could consider something like this, still valuable as a first stepping stone where the students encounter chaos, where the students encounter each other socially, but within the framework of given a specific task, because it's specific 15 minutes within the class, then the teacher starts to introduce new steps into this. It uh, allows the students to choose their own task. It allows the students to choose their own software. It allows the students at certain points into the 15 weeks of a semester to start being able to venture out on their own. If we see this as a dynamic concept, something that progresses over time towards goals and an evolution of, of type, then I think there we can see a connection clearly between what Simon may have put in front of us and what we may have uh, disagreed with at first towards something that uh, the other Simon might uh, uh, want, which is that the students can then uh, 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 create their own uh, task. See it in a dynamic frame. Don't yeah. see it only as the one that was given in front of you. Kevin, anything Great. to contribute? Um, yeah, I, was, I, I think it was interesting. I think um, in terms of sort of as a motivating activity versus demotivating, I think level of challenge was quite interesting. There were bits that all groups couldn't quite do or, you know, they were comfortable with the language and then you were asking them to do something creative. So I think that notion of level of challenge was quite motivating. And then that notion of sort of competing in groups, which I mentioned at the start, I think is a good format. Um, the couple of negatives that I think people touch on that um, the, the challenge of kind of pick up and play, um, you know, it, it took quite a while for people to realize what they were doing there and then maybe sort of sense of progression. I'm not sure that it went somewhere. Um, but I think what we're doing now is actually, you know, a really valuable part of that. We're reflecting on it, which is often the people that the, the piece that people forget to do or don't have time to do mm. or don't sort of devote energy to that. The sort of why was this important? And it may be the activity may be important or the way it was set up or the things that you assumed or didn't assume, which I think is the rich discussion we're having now. So the discussion about what we did and why we did it is as valuable. And I think, you know, you could amend that activity and let's say we all met next time and you said, hey, like that first activity, but how should we change it? And you could give that ownership. So I think there's a bit of trust that feels like an orientation kickoff icebreaker where everyone's a bit nervous and whatever. And then it's got some positive reinforcement. We all kind of did it. We all kind of had fun. And I think next time, you know, there would be that trust in the instructor and you would be able to use that as a framework and say a bit like that. Now let's do something different yeah. and you guys can take some ownership. So I think it was valuable. We, hell, none of us knew each other. 25 to 30 <laughs> of us got through without hating each other's guts. Without, without too much pain. Fun. Yeah. Mike? Yeah. Um, I think uh, student expectations come into come into this, like uh, the other Simon uh, was, you know, had some problems with it and the way it, it didn't have enough structure or, yeah. I think students generally want some structure because they're used to it. It's because, especially in Japan, students have been given structure all their lives and then they go into uh, self-organized or, or right. um, you know, self-organized classroom and they don't really know what to do and it can be it can be a little bit unnerving for some students mm. but yeah, i no still doubt. think it works yeah no doubt yeah so setting setting that task up um uh, obviously i didn't I, I didn't know how many musicians artists uh would, would be amongst us i was pretty sure that we would have quite a lot of wordy people and um a... sorry jose simon can i just I just want to make a point uh, to uh, reinforce what Mike said. Um, I was helping a friend of mine's daughter who was fluent in English and wanted to be a mathematician. So we found a way to get her off to um, Canada to study abroad in mathematics. Her English was good enough to be able to do that. And she was a mathematician before she even went in. And when she went there, one of the biggest problems in culture shock was because she was raised in a Japanese high school environment. Uh, to suddenly be asked to take care of herself as a first year university student in Canada. She came back and uh, because we're all good friends, she was in tears telling me and her mother that because uh, she had been told all her life, do this, do this, do this, exactly this way, wear your skirt this height, cut your bangs at this point, that 
Nobody told her what to do. Everything was up to her. And it was just an incredible amount of stress. And when you consider that um, we have those students uh, in their psychological framework, I think uh, what Mike just said is very, very important. Mm. I think, you know, so early on, uh, right in the front. Kumiko, I, sorry, Kumiko. Simon, oh, Kumiko has a point. Sorry, didn't see that. Is it okay? Okay, I'm sorry. Sure, I, no. I'm sorry I, I joined 40 minutes later. So actually, maybe I missed half of the, the session. So maybe I may, like, you know, misunderstanding the point of this. But, like, I understand, like, from the point of view of, like, Japanese person, uh, as, like, you know, the other Simon, not host Simon, but other Simon says, you know, Japanese students are really, really... Uh, not proactive like all the time and then like i grew up in the in this situation in, in this country and then like i always felt different because i was always sort of proactive right and then like you have to understand like you know the the, the students they always konasu. do you know the word konasu? it's like you have to get by right you have to get by with the task you're like given and they always have th those kind of attitude so it is like as simon said it's really difficult to uh, initiate like you know their like motivation and like you know their actions right so I'm having a difficult time how do I combine English class and also like English appropriate attitude like you know it like as a element of the class you understand what I'm saying because mm. like you know when I try to like you know make them more like you know motivated and then more like proactive in the class they're like this is English class why aren't you teaching me something Right. So like, you know, this kind of activity is really interesting and I like it, but like, I don't know how much like I can like, you know, get from my students. Like, you know, I don't know how to say, I'm sorry, today is like my holiday mode and my English is like kind of, you know, off. But anyways, you know, it's really difficult. Like, you know, I understand I you, like this is really interesting for certain type of students like me. It's really interesting. Oh, teamwork. But for some like, you know, students, I don't know how much it is. Like, you know, enjoyable. Mm. What do you okay. think? Todd, well, I think Todd. that is. Yeah, kind of actually similar to what uh, she was just saying. I, I created this, these paper games. And they're very peer-to-peer -peer and they learn from each other. And I thought I really cracked the code and they were very popular. And when I did the survey at the end of the term, they scored very highly. But I think a lot of what we're doing is, it's like you said, it's, it's in the, like she just said as well, it's independent student preferences. It's whack-a-mole. So, some students hated it. They absolutely hated the peer-to-peer the -peer games. And they were the minority, but as it turns out, they were the best students. And they were like writing comments like, just give me the words. <laughs> I can do it on my own. I don't need to work with anybody else. So, I mean, I think the thing is, it's just balance, right? Like we just have mm. to admit that we're always gonna have this problem. Like there's, the students are gonna have varied preferences of how they're gonna wanna learn. And it's like, I think it's impossible to crack. I think it's impossible. Some people want very didactic, top down. You're the sensei, you tell me what to do. Some people want to do collaborative learning, learn on their own. I just wonder if it's something that's maybe, it's impossible to master. Okay, yeah. um, so, uh, Simon, the, did you want to go? Yeah. Okay, go. The, um, obviously we have limited time today. Somebody's put into the, some, some put into the uh, chat thread, um, what was, how is this about destroying education? Well. The idea really, the top idea was that uh, this should replicate a project that would, would work on in the real life, possibly for work. So there were multiple tasks within that. Uh, there was the logo, um, the strap line, uh, the theme music, and then of course the answers for the game themselves. So uh, one, of the, one of the projects that I worked on, Happy Valley, our, our preschool um, uh, product was divided into many, many projects. And, and this is how we work in the real world, particularly these days in the international online digital gig economy. And the idea is to try and replicate that sort of exercise where um, the task is set, somebody needs a piece of work, how do you divide it? Uh, putting you into groups and asking you to divide yourselves into the work that you wanted to do was part of that. And Louise hinted that that, that, that was done. I talked earlier on about trying to discover innate talents. Lo and behold, it turned out that Simon Robinson's a pretty mean uh, ukulele player. And, uh, and he went and, and did that. This was obviously a very, very short task and this short task on its own will not 
uh, destroy education. But the idea is to show this an example of how projects work in the real world. This is not meant to be something that's to be taken into an institutional classroom. This is uh, a way to encourage people to get out of the institutional classroom and work on real stuff in the real world. Ideally, yes, of course, everybody should get to choose what they want to do. And, you know, everybody was, was free to leave at any time that they uh, wanted to today. So, you know, I'm grateful that, uh, that every, everybody stayed, but I'm not suggesting this is uh, something that you should take into your classrooms. I'm suggesting that people shouldn't step into them in the first place and they should work on real projects in the real world. I'm sorry, I have to go everybody. Yeah. Thanks Simon, thanks, thanks other Simon, thank everybody else and we, I hope to see you at the next session. But I we, have, we have run over by 30 minutes. So um, is, is there anything that crucially anybody really wants to add at the end? Can I add one more thing? Sure. I didn't mean to criticize this activity. It was really fun. No, it's, I it's really not, appreciate. And like, I really wish all my students can handle this kind of uh, activity. Mm. And, but this is my wish. And then the reality is not there. And I'm having like a little like difficult time tra like struggling with this kind of situation, especially going online. Mm. You cannot ignore those like you know, unmotivated students. The, um, the Google document with the questions remains up and uh, it'd be great if people could contribute to that. We didn't really get around to uh, addressing what we actually should do. Um, the activity took up uh, such a lot of time. Uh, but yeah, how, how could we change things? Uh, obviously, none of, us, uh, none of us are in government. We can't pass a law tomorrow that will destroy educa institutional education. So what can we do? Glenn, did you have your hand raised there? Yeah, I just wanted to... Uh say that I put a little comment in the chat and it's uh, in response to what Kumiko said. I mean, most of us here are not Japanese and she is. Mm. So I think we should pay a lot more attention to the fact that we are in the foreign environment mm. as foreigners. My son is Japanese because he has a Japanese mother and mm. has never been to America. We have to really pay attention. Yeah, they're learning a different culture and a way of life than us. Yep. Maybe we want to change it. And my only suggestion for Kumiko is try and show your kids videos of Japanese students who have come back from study abroad. Get, get their feelings for what they really faced. One of, the, uh, one of the other things that I always bring up when talking about all of this is to look at a company like Rakuten who have adopted English as their working um, language and all of their meetings are held in English. And increasingly, um, in, for employment prospects, uh, people are going to have to work online remotely in English, whether those are uh, text or verbal conversations. And um, of course, people from all over the world get together uh, and work on, on projects. And some will be Japanese, some will be Russian, some will be British and American. And uh, as I said, uh, right at the beginning, uh, working together on um, diverse projects across national boundaries is something that I, uh, I think we should encourage rather than try and force a Socratic method on, on, on a Confucian society. That's not my aim at all. Mm. Cool. Nice. Well said. Okay. Um, I think I'll wrap it up there. Thank you everybody for coming. And uh, please do contribute to the Google document if you can. And uh, I might see you for some, some of you for drinks on Friday. All right. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks. See ya.